Hey programmers, welcome back. Right now, let's do a lecture on data types and expressions. So if you wanna code along with this one, I'll walk through how you can set up your environment once more. So what you wanna do is open up a VS Code. Now uh, recall that VS Code is the program that we use to write all of our JavaScript code, right? So I'm just look it up, Visual Studio Code it's called. Go ahead and open up that. And what I'll also do is create a nice folder for myself where I'll store my work for today. So I'll just right click, new folder, and I'll call this my little lecture. Then from there, I wanna make sure that my VS Code is actually opened inside of this folder, right? So what I can do is, here's like the welcome screen for VS Code, I can just X this out, go to this view, and then hit open folder, and just navigate to my folder, which is called lecture, right? So I'll open up that. So now that VS Code is open, what I'll do is I'll just make this full screen for myself, and I'll need to create a file inside of this lecture folder, right? So in the left-hand view, I can hit this little paper icon. That'll let me create a file, and I'll call this expressions.js, you can call it really whatever you want, but do make sure that it ends in .js, right? It stands for JavaScript. That way I can actually execute this code by the rules of JavaScript. So just to make sure I can actually execute this code, let me just start by saying console.log. I'll print out a nice message, makes it a little bigger for y'all. And I'll just say hello, right? That way I can just get all of this setup out of the way so we can actually learn something new. So recall that we use VS Code to write our JavaScript code, but we're gonna to need to use our terminal to actually execute and run it. If you're on Mac, you can just search for your terminal application and use that to execute your code. If you're on Windows, you wanna open up a command line, which is really just like the terminal for a Windows machine. In VS Code, it actually also has a built-in terminal, right? So what you can do is Control tilde to open up that little terminal. And what I'll need to do next is make sure that my terminal is actually right next to my expressions.js file. So also remember that I can do ls inside of the terminal. So that command ls, it'll list out all of the files I can currently see inside of the lecture folder. And here I'm already right next to expressions.js. If I wanted to execute it, I need to do node and then write the name of the file, which is expressions.js, right? Go cool. on there, it is running. And key thing to remember, if you see like the uh, dot, so let's say I change this code a little bit. If you see a dot in your VS Code file name, then that means that you don't have it saved, right? So you want to save it first by doing Control S or Command S, right? So add my semicolon and save it. And there I am set up in my environment. All right, with that set up out of the way, let's jump right in. What I want to teach all of you today is about data types and some simple expressions using those data types in JavaScript. And this is really just going to be like the essence of programming in a sense. So the first data type I wanna teach you about is just numbers, right? So I'll write down a few numbers and they're all valid numbers in JavaScript, right? So a valid number would be something like zero or like 42 or like 11.5 or even a negative number like negative 12, right? And these are all just valid uh, JavaScript values. And what I'll do is I'll just print them out using console.log, right? So I'm gonna wrap uh, each of these up in a console.log. And what you'll notice is these are just like literal numbers without any quotation marks around them, which makes them of the number type. So I'll run this file now. There I see all of these numbers, nothing fancy. So these numbers by themselves are not super interesting, but what I can do is write some expressions utilizing these numbers. So I'll switch things up. Maybe I'll console.log and I can just write some math, right? So I can say something like one plus one. And that's a nice long expression. And you know some math, right? This will just evaluate to the number two. And so how does JavaScript interpret this code? Well, it sees this expression and it sees this plus operation. One plus one evaluates to two. So this code just prints out really just two. An important theme for today is any expression that you write in JavaScript must evaluate to a single value, right? So something that's self-evident here is that I don't literally see like the text one plus one over here. What I see is the result or its evaluation, which is just two. We have some other, you know, very familiar math operations that exist in JavaScript and basically in every programming language, right? I could say something like, what's two times eight using that star operator? And if I run that, it gives me 16, right? I could do some division as well. So let me do what's 12 divided by three, just using the slash. That's just give me a four. And we finally also have some subtraction, right? I could do, let's say 100 minus 101, which should just give me negative one at the bottom. And so all of these fundamental arithmetic operations like addition, multiplication, division, and subtraction do exist uh, in JavaScript. And they evaluate in a nothing fancy uh, kind of way. And of course, what you can do is combine these operations. So I can say something like, hey, minus five, well, I just evaluate this in pieces, right? So how does JavaScript literally evaluate this code step by step? Well, it's gonna see this expression and evaluate left to right, right, in parts. And so one plus one gives me two, and then two minus five gives me negative three, right? And so the final result here should be negative three. 
right? So when I have a longer expression, it's really just a matter of understanding how like the pieces and parts of that expression evaluate and just evaluate it, right? However, things will get kind of tricky when it comes to like the order of operations that exist in JavaScript. And for our arithmetic operations, they're really just the classic order of operations in math. So for example, if I had an expression like this, let's say one plus two times five, what does this actually print out, right? What does this expression evaluate to? Well, it's actually the case that this highlighted bit, so that two times five would evaluate first because multiplication has a higher order of operations than addition, right? So if I evaluate this expression, technically this happens first, right? Two times five is 10, 10 plus one is 11, right? So do bear that in mind as well, right? So I'll run this code and I should get 11, right? There it is. And if you wanted to like force uh, the order of operations, what you can do is wrap a certain part of the expression in parentheses, right? And group it together. So let's say I want the addition to happen first. So I can just wrap this in parentheses. And then this evaluates to three and then three times five should give me 15, right? That's essentially what you could also do if you were just writing this in math, right? So nothing too fancy there. Let's just work in some terminology. So we have a few operations that we can do uh, in JavaScript with our numbers, right? We have like addition and like multiplication. Those are like the names of the operations. When I refer to like the symbol, like this star, I call it like the multiplication operator, right? And this is the addition operator. And the same way, like these parentheses, I'll call like the grouping operator, right? So just bear in mind that like an operator is the symbol that performs some operation. So let's look at another number operation that's kind of not as common to learn in just like a classic mathematical setting. And that one would be modulo. So let's say I had 13. And what I did was percent symbol five, right? So this operation is called modulo and I represent it using the percent symbol. And how do I interpret the modulo operation? Well, what it does is give you back the remainder of the division, right? In other words, if I see this expression, what it's asking is when I divide 13 by five, what is the remainder, right? So 13 divided by five is two, but with the remainder of three, right? So really this expression would give me back just a three. So I'll run it here and it just gives me back a three. So again, just to lay it out there, 13 divided by five gives me two with a remainder of three. And so my final answer is just the three over here, right? And how can I kind of check my work? Well, I can say five times two gives me 10, 10 plus three gives me 13, right? So bear in mind, modulo always gives you the remainder of the division. So if I kind of switch things up over here, what would happen if I made 14 modulo five? Well, then it's just gonna give me a remainder of four. That's because when I divide 14 by five, five only fits into 14 twice with the remaining quantity of four. And again, to check my work, I could do five times two gives me 10 plus four gives me 14. And so let's do another example using like modulo by five. Let's say I had 15 mod five. Well, this one's kind of interesting, right? If I do 15 mod five, again, I'm asking, what is the remainder when I divide 15 by five? Well, that remainder is just gonna be zero. And that's actually a valid answer when it comes to modulo, right? If I check my work over here, I do 15 modulo five. So how many times can five fit into 15? Well, three times, like perfectly, with the remaining quantity of zero. And how do I check my work? Well, I could do five times three is 15, plus zero is still 15. So zero is a totally valid result to give back when it comes to a modulo operation. So let me jot down a few and we'll predict them together. So here I have a few expressions and let's kind of predict how they evaluate together, right? So looking at the first one, here we have 13 modulo six. Another way that I'll kind of refer to like the modulo operation is saying mod just for short. So I'll kind of read this by saying 13 mod six. So what is the remainder? When I divide 13 by six, the remainder is just going to be one right? Because six goes into 13 twice with a remainder of one. So that one's nothing fancy. And the second one, I do eight mod four, right? I know that that remainder is going to be zero, right? Because eight is perfectly divisible uh, by four. So it has no remaining quantity. Looking at this third one over here, we do 10 mod four, which is going to give us a remainder of two, right? And how do I check my work? Well, how many times can four go into 10? Well, four goes into 10 twice with the remainder of two. And I should just give back the remaining quantity, which is like this particular two uh, over here. So let's check our work for the first three before we look at the last one over here. So I'll run this code to get one, zero, two. Awesome. And let's look at this last example over here. And in my experience of like teaching people about this like modulo operation, for some reason they struggle with like this a little bit, right? So it's pretty evident that, hey, 10 mod four is two, but then what is four mod 10, right? I'm just flipping the order of like these numbers here. And so now what this is asking is, 
what is the remainder when I divide four by 10? And what you know is like 10 cannot fit into four at all. So 10 goes into four zero times, but then what's the remainder? Well, the remaining quantity must be the entire thing of just four, right? So what I'm saying is the final answer in this module operation is just four. And again, how do I check my work? Well, I do 10 times zero, which is zero, plus four gives me four, right? So basically the entire quantity uh, is the entire remainder. So I'll run this code, right? And there I see four as that result. And this holds true for like other patterns, right? What we're really saying here is when you have a small number and you mod it by a larger number, the answer is just gonna be that smaller number, right? So in other words, if I did like seven, modulo 101 without even thinking too much, I know that this is just gonna give me seven, right? Because I know 101 can't possibly fit into seven, so the entire remainder is just the whole seven. So I'll run this code and I should see a seven printed out. Nice. So as you like learn these different operations in JavaScript, what really helps is noticing any patterns that way you can quickly, you know, reason out how these things evaluate. There's a lot of tricks and shortcuts you can use and patterns to recognize to really help you understand the code quickly, right? So that was a lot about the modulo operation. So in total, right, modulo gives you the remainder of the division. But let's keep things rolling and talk about another uh, data type. So another data type that you learned already, but we didn't really give it a name was strings, right? So a string is really just some text, right? So I wrap up a string in quotation marks. So he'll have a nice string. I'll call it my name, Alvin, right? And when it comes to a string, it can contain multiple characters. So you can type any characters uh, between your quotation marks, right? So you can put like numeric characters on the inside. You could put any symbols on the inside. As long as they're wrapped in quotation marks, it's still a valid string, right? So let me run this code, just some string data. You can totally have capital letters, right? So that's totally fine if you wanted to do that. And something to note about strings is uh, when it comes to how you wrap your strings or enclose your strings, you can use either double quotes or single quotes. So for example, another valid way to represent the string is to use single quotes, but you must match those symbols, right? So if I open with single quotes, then I ought to close also with single quotes. So if I run this code, these two are really the same string, right? There's nothing too different about them. So you're probably wondering, you know, if I can use either double quotes or single quotes when it comes to representing my string pieces of data, uh, what's really the point of that? Like, why do I have the option? Nothing is usually by chance, right? That was actually a deliberate decision in JavaScript and in many programming languages. That's because you may actually want to have like a quotation mark as a character uh, within a string. So let's say I cleared this out and I changed things up. Let's say what I'll do is I'll wrap up my entire string in double quotes, which means I could use a single quote on the inside. So I can say something like Alvin, single quote, it's hungry, right? Like Alvin is hungry. So if I run this code, this is a totally valid string, right? And what's important is because I wrap like my entire string in double quotes, that allows me to easily use a single quote on the inside, right? So this is totally valid uh, JavaScript. Something that would be invalid is if I wrapped up my string in single quotes as well. You can see that already looks funny uh, in my VS code. That's because how JavaScript will evaluate. So if I tried to run this code, it's not even going to run, right? Syntax error just refers to like incorrect code that we wrote, it doesn't understand what we're trying to say. So JavaScript is going to see this opening single quote, and then it's gonna anticipate us writing down a few more characters that are going to be like the content of the string. So then it sees ALVIN and then another single quote. And at this point, it has seen this total expression. So I'll just highlight it, which is just the string Alvin. And then it sees S afterwards. It's not even gonna know what S is, which is why I get an error over here, right? Because it interprets really just this part as my entire string. So key takeaway is, oh, you'll want to use different types of quotation marks depending on what you're using on the inside of your expression, right? So what I can do is maybe have like single quotes on the outside and say the dog said, and then double quotes, woof. That's also a totally valid string. It's really up to you. So that's just a string data type in a nutshell, right? It's really just some text. You can put any characters you want inside of a string. And when it comes to the operations that we can do, I'll teach you two operations you can do right now. So let's say I had some string data. Let's say I had cat and also dog. What I can do is use the like addition operator on cat and dog. And this is actually going to work also for strings. And what it does is have the effect of just combining those strings together into a single string. So basically it just gives me back one word of cat dog. And because I know that JavaScript can evaluate in pieces, I can totally, you know, add another string if I wanted to. I could do like cat plus dog plus mouse. It gives me cat dog mouse. 
So that's a one operation Now you can totally do. Another operation that I'll show you for now is that you can turn strings uppercase and lowercase. So let's say I had like the literal string cat. What I can do is after I end the string, so that means after the closing quotation mark, I can write dot, I can say to uppercase. And this has to be spelled a very particular way, right? What you need to do is put a capital U and a capital C, and that's just because that's what the method is named uh, in JavaScript, right? And if you want to use the to uppercase method, you're gonna need to also open and close a parentheses at the end of it. And what this will do is just evaluate to the uppercase version of the string cat, right? So I'll run that code. I see capital cat printed out uh, in a similar way. If you had an uppercase string like dog with a capital D, you can use two lowercase on it. And it does exactly what you expect. A few things you'll want to keep in mind if you use like the two uppercase and two lowercase methods is that you'll need to capitalize the U and the C in two uppercase and something similar for two lowercase, but more importantly, also end it with an open and close uh, parentheses. And we'll actually later on in the course, we'll really understand what this kind of refers to. But for now, just understand what it does, right? This is how I could just turn some string, uppercase or lowercase. All right, so that wraps up part one of this lecture. In the next video, we'll talk about some other expressions we can write using comparisons.